السلام عليكم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين One of the issues critics of Islam and those who turned away from Islam always bring up is the topic of Sharia law as they question the entire faith of Islam because of the penalty limits sanctioned in the Sharia law hence portraying Islam as a violent or medieval faith or whatever else that suits their purpose. What does Sharia mean? What does Sharia or Sharia law mean or refer to? What are the sources of Sharia? What is its purpose? What does it entail? Uh, can Sharia law be changed? What about its punishment laws? In this session, we will address these questions and more. The intention of this session is to give an introduction and provide a basic understanding of the Sharia law while addressing the above questions. Sharia literally means the path leading to watering place. In Arabic, shari'a means the road, the thoroughfare. Sharia refers to a way of life. It is a path shown to us by God and his messengers, given to us by God himself. Defined as such, Islam is Sharia or a path shown to us by God, as the Qur'an says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعَهَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعَ أَحْوَاءَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Then we put you, O Muhammad, on the ordained path concerning the matter of religion. So follow it, and do not follow the inclinations of those who do not know. Chapter 45, verse 18. The verse, this verse means, in this verse, Sharia existed in the Prophet's time as a way of life. Of course, perhaps not in many details in the beginning and only for limited applications, but expanded later by, by the scholars and jurists' uh, extraction to more details. Of course, within the framework of Islamic principles. So Sharia, as defined originally in early Islam, with what is understood as today, may be different. Sharia is not a law Actually, Islamic law is based on the Sharia, the path. That is why we call it Sharia law, a law that comes from Sharia and governs many aspects of Muslims' daily life, including the rituals. Hence, they call it Sharia law. Primary source of Sharia is the Quran, outlining principles concerning many topics such as Aqidah, or the Articles of Faith, Ibadat, Acts of Worship, Business Transaction, Mu'amalat, and few others we will talk about later. The secondary source is the authentic tradition of the Messenger of God, which is basically the Qur'an in practice, which goes into details of generalities and implementational aspects. From these two sources, we primarily derive the Sharia law. There is the third source, which we will talk about later. Then the question becomes, if the sources are the Qur'an and the Sunnah tradition, can the Sharia law change? The short answer is, it depends. Some Contemporary Muslim thinkers and reformers have suggested that Sharia is in two parts. One part being about ruling on acts of worship and the Islamic belief system or aqidah, and perhaps moral teachings, which are all individual based or about the 
relationship between the individual and God. The second part of Sharia, which is in connection between the individual and the society, or other members of the society, including the social and family issues, penal code, and civil aspects. They suggest the first part of Sharia, which is between the individual and God, cannot be changed. For example, believing in articles of faith or ruling on, rulings on rituals like prayers and fasting, etc. But the second part, which is between the individual and others, can be changed or replaced according to times, conditions, and what is common or orf. They suggest social laws, for example, should be legislated by people within the society according to the time they live in and according to what is orf or common, or common law, or the secular law or convention, to put it simply. They further claim that even Prophet salam did not change all the traditions and rules that were in place within the Arab society. Only those which were in direct or indirect conflict with Islam. And did he did adopt the traditions with neither harm nor conflict with Islam. Hence, times have changed and we should not stay with any law or tradition that no longer applies to our times or is in conflict with orf common law or common practice. While this may sound appealing to some people, it is a distorted view which stems from deficient understanding of the Sharia. Firstly, which orf or common law? We have Muslims in Asia, in Europe, in Americas, in Africa, spread all over the world. Each country or region has its own culture and ORF standard. And what do each region's Muslim community must do? Should they implement one ORF common practice or have different ones for each region? What is the basis for following a certain ORF or common practice? Or should they just follow the majority, which in this case may be non-Muslims' common laws or secular laws? What if these common laws or what is ORF have consequences that are in conflict with the spirit of Islamic law? Therefore, many problems and questions arise from such notion. What they don't realize is that Sharia is flexible and allows new rulings as needs arise or conditions change. So, let's talk about that a little bit, change in Sharia ruling. Sharia has safeguards and concepts in place where under certain conditions, rulings may change within its framework or as long as its ground rules are not violated. A simple lesson or example would be the rule on fasting. As reflected in the Qur'an itself, while fasting is obligatory in Ramadan, if the person is sick or on travel, the ruling under this condition changes and he becomes exempt until he can make it up. Same with social issues and, and individuals dealing with the society. One example is the principle of la varar, no harm. As the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, la varara wa la varara fil Islam. No harm should be done or received according to Islam. Islam limits things that cause harm or loss to members of the society. One who hoards wealth the money and at the expense of the society members 
without giving back is curtailed by Islam. There is principle of la haraj or no hardship which is applied when there is unnecessary hardship in implementing something. There is also the principle of necessity. The trouble comes when some respected Muslim reformers or intellectuals want to change the Sharia law based on ORF or the laws commonly practiced in secular nations, ignoring the fact that within Islamic Sharia or Sharia there are ground rules or frameworks built in within which the rules can change, so no need to change Sharia or abandon it, the fundamental rules of Sharia, or abandon it. In other words, Sharia allows ruling change within itself as long as the ground rules are applied. This way, nothing goes against the Sharia and no innovation or bid'ah has occurred. An example is what is commonly considered among the scholars and jurists as they say, when the subject or objective changes, the ruling changes as well. In other words, the ruling follows the subject or objectives. An example would be, um, in Prophet's time, due to high degree of animosity and hate, they often used to dismember the body of the person they killed. They would, for example, take the heart or other parts of the body out, called musla. Sharia forbade such practice as it considered it barbaric. And because, and another reason was because this act hardens people's hearts. However, today, we know body parts can be donated and taken out of the dead body for medical research or autopsy can be done in order to identify cause of death, all of which are allowed by Sharia for this purpose or objective. In other words, the ruling changed because the subject changed. These principles, such as harm, hardship, necessity, or change of subject or objective, allow Muslim scholars or jurists to reach a new ruling, fatwa, through certain processes, such as ijtihad, deductive reasoning, and qiyas, reason by analogy, provided the new ruling is not in conflict directly or indirectly with Sharia law, or at least capture the, spirits, the spirit of the relevant objective using the ground rules within the Sharia itself. The process of ijtihad, or deductive reasoning, unfortunately is not utilized as much as it should be, or halted altogether according to some scholars. These are tools that scholars and jurists can use in order to issue rulings that are applicable as the conditions and the environment change. So there are no needs for those for these reformers to propose utilizing ORF which may not align with the spirit of Sharia. On the Sharia penalty penalty ruling, if the objective no longer reached, or any of the conditions for such ruling are not met, then the punishment may be changed to what is common per Islamic court. More on this later, more on all of this later. Otherwise, if Islam is neutral or agrees with a certain common law or orf, then there's nothing wrong with adopting such a law. All we're saying is that the solution is within the Sharia itself and within all Muslims' reach. As a side note, in order for us to reform deen, which is really a wrong word, it should be to revitalize or to restore deen, we must first understand its usul, 
fundamental and principles, then eliminate whatever has been added to it, a bid'ah, innovation. Hence, set aside all the extras and return to the noble Qur'an, which is the authority. Review the re relevant verses and laws which were sent down for all mankind for all times. Of course, the next step is to utilize the sunnah in order to refine and detail these rulings. Then, as needed, use the aforementioned principles and ijtihad to change or expand the rulings in order to address the conditional or environmental changes. Those who want to go directly to ORF, the common law, the secular law, and abrogate the Sharia law, do not know that the Qur'an says, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسَهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ غَدِيرٍ None of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten except we substitute something better or similar. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? Chapter 2, verse 106. Which means the Qur'an itself abrogates any ruling or changes it to similar, something similar. It did not leave it up to people to make the change. Hence, if we change anything, it has to be done through careful consideration, diligent ijtihad, deductive reasoning, and without resorting to orf, a common practice, which may not align with the Islamic principles. Another issue brought up by the so-called reformers of Islam is the topic of expansion and reduction of Sharia. Is Sharia expandable or perhaps reducible? From Sharia point of view itself, we know that Sharia will allow, will allow it through what, what, what we call expansion of masadiq or applications. One example would be expanding the no harm principle. Harming others was something common back in even Prophet's time. However, we know now we have even more ways by which people can harm each other or each other's interests, like through internet, for example. So this principle of expansion in Sharia does not mean the fundamental of Sharia itself expands uh, or reduces or changes, rather its application or applicability, what we call masadiq, expand or reduce. Then there are civil laws of the land that were created to establish order in the society and do not involve Sharia. They have nothing to do with Sharia. For example, traffic laws or trade laws, etc. Many of which Islam has left for humans to figure out and legislate. Even, even in mu'amila, transactions, Sharia only rules on what is forbidden, like usury, but does not get into topic on how to invest, does not tell you how to invest. It encourages, in fact, investing by lawful means, of course, but leaves the how-tos to people's creativity. More on rulings later. So, after this introduction, uh, what is the objective of Sharia? The purpose of Sharia is to make humans better human beings, make them morally and ethically righteous human beings. As a result, produce better societies where liberty and justice flourish. In Sharia, everything has rights. You have rights as individual. God has rights. 
other individuals in the community and society have rights. Hence, Sharia aims to fulfill these rights, to take care of obligations and establish justice in the society. It tells us what is obligatory and what is forbidden. It also tells us what is recommended and what is not recommended and leaves all in between permissible, which is a big range to choose from without being negligent, of course, or wasteful or going excess. People who do not adopt God's laws and limits can go extremes, like giving too much freedom in one extreme and taking people's freedom away in another extreme, both of which we have examples of today. Islam balances the life of individuals as well as the society among all available choices. All in all, total address of Islam to its followers is called the Sharia. Now, let's describe comprehensively what are individual goals and objectives of Sharia. And after we're done, you will see these objectives vastly align with what's commonly practiced and what makes sense in many democratic countries with similar constitutions. Number one, nurturing the righteous individual. First goal to develop and nurture the righteous human beings to be a source of good for himself or herself and for the community and to reduce or eliminate any bad that may occur from him or her that may harm himself or herself or people in the community. This takes place through the Islamic teachings, Islamic rituals, and Islamic moral system that aim at developing the righteous human beings. Number two, Establishing justice and security in the society. To establish justice between people within the community of believers and with other communities and groups. As the Quran says, Indeed, Allah enjoins justice and doing good. Chapter 16, verse 90. Or, in chapter 4, verse 135, it says, Allah commands justice. O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even if it is against yourselves or your parents or your kinfolks, and whether it be against the rich or the poor, for Allah can best product, uh, protect both. Follow not the desires of your hearts in case you lapse from the truth, and if you distort Justice or decline to do justice, indeed Allah is well acquainted with all that you do. Or even regarding the enemy or those we may hate, the Quran enjoins justice and equity. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu kunu qawwamina lillah shuhada'a bil qist wa la yajrimannakum shan'anu qawmin. So then it says, O oh, you who believe, stand out firmly for, for Allah in equity, for fair dealing, and let not hatred of any people swerve you to deal unjustly. Deal justly. That is nearer to you, to your uh, duty to Allah. Chapter 5, verse 8. Justice in Islam is a noble goal and is comprehensive. Islam promotes justice in the court, justice in dealing with each other, justice to family members, and justice with oneself. 
Sharia considers people to be equal. No one is superior over another because of race, wealth, or family. No one is above the law. Sharia obligates Muslims to be just with their enemies even during war. Number three, preserving and protecting interests, maslaha or benefits. Or shall we say, bringing about benefits and removing harm is essential part of the Sharia. These five benefits or interests are essential to the honorable human life which Sharia aims to protect. These are A. Protecting religion B. Protecting life C. Protecting intellect and mind D. Protecting progeny and family preservation E. Protecting, protecting ownership and property Now, we talk about each one of these five benefits. Protecting religion. You see, religion is what differentiates human being from the other creations of God. It is part of the honor that God gives to humanity. Therefore, it has to be protected. First, Sharia protects religion by establishing the ruling that لا إكراه في الدين There is no compulsion in religion. Chapter 2, verse 256. Then, Sharia makes it forbidden to afflict people because of their faith or to force them to embrace another religion, if, 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 even if that other religion is Islam. In other words, freedom of religion and religious expression. Allah said in the Quran that persecution is worse and more severe than killing. So, forcing people to convert is a form of persecution. A general look at the rituals of Islam reveals that a major goal behind them is to strengthen people's faith and the relationship between people and their creator. Sharia, for example, legislates fighting, known as jihad, to protect against many types of transgression foremost of which is transgression over people's religion. So, before many constitutions in the West, including U.S. Constitution, and amendments were drafted, Islam brought freedom of religion and religious expression 14 centuries ago through its Sharia. The next one, protecting life. It should be well established that life is a sacred thing because it is a gift that God gives humans and only He can take it. One of the miracles of this universe is the creation of the human being. مِنْ آيَاتِ أَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ إِذَا أَنْتُمْ and of his signs is that he created you from dust and you became humans scattered throughout the earth. Chapter 30, verse 21. One in many verses that describe this, you know, the sacredness of life. The Sharia makes the life of a single human being so valuable and Allah in the Qur'an said that killing one person is, a, is as if one kills the whole humanity. And saving the life of one person is as if the life of all humanity is saved. مَنْ غَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسًا أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا غَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ Jamia. Chapter 5, verse 32. Sharia forbids killing without a just cause and it dictates the most severe punishment for it in this life and the hereafter. It also prohibits injuring people, harming them physically or even symbolically. It allows and encourages people to live honorably. 
gives them the right to migrate if necessary, encourages them to think and speak freely and responsibly. Even cultivating land is highly recommended. No trees are to be cut as a means of warfare. No bird or animal to be killed except for food. No mass killing in, in a war is allowed because in mass killing, many innocent, including women and children, are killed. This includes poisoning the enemy's well or dropping bombs over enemy's towns and villages. The next one, protecting mind and intellect. This is another objective of Sharia. Intellect is also a gift. It is what differentiates human from animals and lets us distinguish good from bad. Protecting the intellect from any disease is a genuine objective of Islamic Sharia. Sharia makes sure intellect is a source of benefit to the society. It promotes education for all and makes it a right for everyone. Sharia also states that if the intellect gets corrupted, it becomes harmful to the individual and to the society. Sharia fights strongly against such corruption. Not only the mind should be protected from censorship, but also from repression, fear, and stress. Anything Anything that numbs or kills minds is disliked, and that is the main reason behind forbidding intoxicants. Contemplation and reflection are religious duties. In Sharia, freedom of thought and expression are basic human rights. The very first word and command revealed in the Qur'an was Iqra, read. Protecting family, progeny, or descendants. That's another goal. In order to maintain life and pass the torch to generations to come, Sharia aims to protect progeny. Every child has the right to grow in a family. The family is obligated to take care of the children and develop them. Marriage has supreme value in Islam, and it has a big share in Islamic Sharia teachings and rulings. Sexual relations outside the marriage are not allowed, and the same-sex marriage is forbidden. An official an official documented marriage contract is the only legitimate way for a couple to pair off and form a family and beget children. Purity of lineage through legitimate births by identified parents and the right to know with certainty one's parents is a must. Breastfeeding is encouraged up to two years. Family planning through natural or artificial means is permitted, but not if it entails the killing of a life. The fetus has the right to life, inheritance, and reception of will or endowment. Uh, one cannot consider his children as a burden and cannot kill them out of fear of poverty or dishonor as people used to do. Mutual rights and duties of spouses and children are detailed in Sharia. Family conduct and rules of inheritance are specified. Marriage is protect protected by law from the abuse of either of the spouses or the abuse of people outside the family. Accusing someone, especially women, of having unlawful sexual relations deserves a strong punishment since spreading such rumors destroys marriages and is dishonorable. Men and women in the society are obligated to protect their chastity, lower their gaze, and deal with one another professionally and in a 
brotherly fashion. All these Sharia teachings are to make sure healthy families are established and children grow up in healthy families and environment. Divorce, although allowed, is discouraged by demanding spouses to endure patience. Divorce is a final resort to fix an unsuccessful family. Resolving marriage conflicts, as stated in the Quran, is another example of how Sharia pays extra attention to the family preservation. An orphan is very valuable, and taking care of an orphan has a reward no less than the company of the Prophet in paradise. Mothers are given special care, especially when they are pregnant or nursing, for they are the ones who nurture the next generation. Sharia's teachings, when followed, result in righteous upbringing of new generations and the real protection of progeny. Last but not least, protection of property and ownership. People have the right to own and protect their property. Sharia aims to protect people's wealth and property. Theft is strictly prohibited and punished by the law. Sharia also regulates transactions between people and states clearly that it has to be built on complete freedom and willingness. Sharia also encourages us to increase our wealth, by lawful means of course, and it ensures that wealth does not reach the hands of those who waste it. The poor have rights in the wealth of the rich through charity, zakat. Unlawful means of collecting wealth are outlined in Islam, such as cheating, fraud, stealing, and also usury, which is a cause of wasting wealth and putting it in the hands of a few rich people without working for it. That is all the objectives of Sharia, the rights or interests that Sharia aims to protect and fight for. Now, I ask, who in the right mind, sound intellect, would disagree with the above objectives? Who with an unbiased mind would reject the above principles regardless of what he or she believes? Was there anything mentioned above that doesn't seem logical, rational, and in conflict with human rights? An important point we should mention here. In, pre in preserving above benefits or interests, maslaha, is that Sharia is not a rigid set of rules to be copied and applied at any place, any time. As we discussed earlier, it follows human ingenuity to address ever-changing situations through progressive legislations, as long as it does not violate the ground rules set by the Qur'an and Sunnah. Three categories in preservation of interests apply. Necessity. A necessity entails any ruling that is essential to protecting one of the objectives or, in other words, without it, the objectives will completely perish. For example, forbidding murder is in the category of necessities because with murder, life is completely lost. Also, other examples of rulings are necessity over rules forbidden. Lesser of two evils should be chosen. Public interest takes precedent over the individual interest. Harm must be removed. Then the number two is need. The category of need contains any ruling without which the objective will be achieved, 
but with a lot of difficulty and burden. For example, the prohibition of monopolies is in this, you know, in, in this category. Although monopolies will not demolish the wealth completely, they place difficulties upon people uh, preserving their own wealth. Number three, the final category is the category of refinements. Refinements achieve the highest quality of the five objectives we mentioned earlier. So this categorization is extremely important in order to arrive at the correct ruling, especially when different benefits compete with each other. What is necessary always overrules the other two categories and so on. For example, just give you a very simple example. Praying in congregation, jama'ah, is important to the preservation of religion and unity of Muslims. However, it is not essential. If praying in congregation puts one, one's life at risk, such as having to pass through an unsafe neighborhood, he can pray at home since the latter is necessary for the preservation of life. Now, let's uh, discuss uh, fiqh. What is fiqh, or Islamic law, jurisprudence? And how does it relate to sharia? How does fiqh uh, relate to sharia? In the Quran, the word fiqh is used to signify deep understanding of matters especially matters related to religion. It was mostly used to mean the understanding, quote-unquote, the understanding of the words of someone else regarding religious matters, the words of Allah and his messengers. The word yafqahun, they understand, or yafqahu are used in the Qur'an to mean general understanding of the deen, religion. Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Whomever Allah wants good for, he will grant him fiqh, deep understanding of the religion. The early scholars of Islam would use fiqh to mean the knowledge and the understanding of the guidance, the rulings, and the way of life Allah prescribed for us. In other words, fiqh is our understanding and knowledge of Allah's sharia. The scholars who came later confined the usage of the word fiqh to the knowledge and understanding of the guidance and the ruling or jurisprudence regarding the actions only, excluding the areas of belief and moral character. We said the primary source of Sharia is the Qur'an and Sunnah, and then Sunnah. However, there are things that are not explicitly or even implicitly mentioned in these primary sources. Then, for ruling such cases, scholars utilize the legal reasoning based on the following methods. First one is called ijma', which is consensus of jurists. It is utilized where the Qur'an and Sunnah are so, uh, silent on a particular issue, or they are not explicit on it. Some argue that only the opinions of scholars are relevant. Most agree that the consensus of Prophet Muhammad's companions or the family of the Prophet is authoritative. Once an ijma' is established, it serves as a precedent. According to the majority of jurists, a decision based on ijma' generally cannot override a statement of the Qur'an or Sunnah. The binding force of ijma' is based on a hadith in which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is reported to have said, my community will never agree on an error. 
So that was number one reasoning or legal reasoning used. Then there is the second one called Qiyas, which is the principle of analogy applied in interpretation of points of Islamic law, not clearly covered in the Quran or Sunnah. It is analogical inference. Analogical inference. And the third one is called ijtihad or deductive reasoning, which is again utilized where the Quran and Sunnah, Sunnah are, not, are, are silent or are not explicit. It utilizes available evidence, religious, scientific, statistical, and social, to reach a ruling, provided it uses the Sharia ground rules and does not conflict with the Quranic principles or the goals of Sharia. It requires a thorough knowledge of theology, revealed texts, and legal theory, usul al-fiqh, plus a sophisticated capacity for legal reasoning and a thorough knowledge of Arabic. It is considered a required religious duty for those qualified to perform it. It should be practiced by means of analogical reasoning, liyas. Its results cannot be, cannot of course contradict the Quran and it may not be used in cases where consensus, ijma, has been reached according to many scholars. Some believe Ijtihad is fallible since more than one interpretation of a legal issue is possible. Islamic reformers, however, call for revitalization of Ijtihad in the modern world. By the way, when it comes to fiqh, part of Sharia, there are rulings on rituals like prayers, fasting, and so forth. Ruling on family issues like marriage, divorce, inheritance. Ruling on humane slaughter of animals. Ruling on contracts, transactions, liability, and property. And there are rulings on crimes and punishment, which is called hudud. This punishment or hudud ruling section of fiqh is very small portion, perhaps 2 to 3 percent of the entire fiqh, and even a smaller portion or percentage of the overall Sharia law. Yet, Hudud receives the most publicity or spotlight from the misinformed and critics of Islam as they claim that Sharia law is barbaric by cutting off hands, lashing, etc. So let's do talk about punishment laws in Sharia. It seems that critics of Islam and those who turned away from Islam due to what I call religious fatigue or ignorance of facts look only at the penal codes or the punishment section of the Sharia law which is a very small portion like I said two to three percent of fiqh and they think that is the entire religion of Islam. And that is all the critics and the misinformed see in Sharia. While in Islamic penal code we have hudud or had. Had is, hudud is the plural form of had. And had means limit or boundary. In other words, Sharia assigns punishment for violating God's limit or God's right, and sometimes people's right assigned by God. When someone's right is violated, it must be restored. However, the hudud, or punishment, can be applied only in cases where all conditions are met. And we'll talk about these conditions in a minute. The second punishment or type of uh, punishment is called besas. Which is, which, uh, which is an Islamic term meaning retaliation in kind, or eye for an eye, or retributive justice. The doctrine of Qisas provides for 
a punishment analogous to the crime. In other words, qisas means the right of a murder victim given to the nearest relative or wali, legal guardian, which can be taking the life of the killer as retribution. Of course, Islam offers other alternatives to the victim's relative, like taking dia, uh, ransom payment, or forgiving the murderer as an act of mercy. Then the third form of punishment is called ta'zir, refers to punishment for offenses at the discretion of the judge, qadi, or ruler of the state, for a crime committed against others and the society, like bribery, selling tainted or defected products, treason, usury, etc. This type of punishment can be what is recognized as common punishment or orf. It's all at the discretion of the judge. Now, let's talk about the conditions. And this is very important. Very important to remember these conditions. The conditions to apply hudud punishments. There are a set of very important points these critics and the misinformed are unaware of. And these are the conditions that must exist in order for the hudud punishment in Sharia law to take place. You see, there are many safeguards which are very important to mention because they make the hudud punishment next to impossible considering today's situation. So let's talk about the conditions. Number one, the authority. The court or the government must be truly Islamic. This means many of the existing judges and existing courts within so-called Islamic governments, Islamic countries, do not qualify because corruption, lying, stealing, cheating, and misuse is rampant among the officials and judges themselves. Hence, far, far from being Islamic. These corrupt officials are not elected by the people and are often guilty of the very crimes they are prosecuting and applying hudud punishment for. Islam is very persistent to true justice and virtuous character. It is meticulous in the matter of justice so much as even the judges look, FaceTime, between the defendant and the plaintiff must be equally divided. He must address them both equally. Number two, the punishment must serve the maslaha, intended interest and objective. If the intended punishment works against the objective or the subject has changed, then it must be replaced by another form of punishment. Number three, proof must be provided along with a confession of the crime or witnesses. If a thief could prove that he or she stole only because of need, then the Muslim society is responsible and would be held at fault for not addressing his need. And he will, they will, the community will be ordered to supply that need and there would be no had punishment. Number four, to be penalized for adultery, there has to be confession or witnesses testifying against the criminal. If any of these are not sufficiently presented, the had penalty is lifted. Punitive punishment or qisas, like in the case of murder, may be averted if the victim's party, the family, is willing to accept ransom or to forgive, which is always considered to be the high road, higher road to take in Islam. Number six, and this is very important, certainty. People cannot be punished with hudud if there is an, any ambiguity in the case. Some scholars have even said it is not permissible to carry out the hudud without the probability of some benefit. 
Based on the principle of ambiguity or doubt, shubahat, it is almost impossible to apply hudud punishments. In other words, slightest ambiguity, doubt, or not meeting any of the above conditions annuls the hudud punishment. And that is the reason, historically, Muslims, Muslim judges and jurists have been ambivalent in applying the hudud punishment due to its stringent requirement for certainty. And, and they have actually erred in the cautious side as they looked for any possible uncertainty to avoid implementing the hudud. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you find a way out for a person, then let them go, for it is better for the authority or the judge to err in mercy side than to err in the punishment side. Therefore, Islamic history contains very few instances that hudud punishment was actually applied. Number seven, the person who violated the hudud must be of sound mind and aware of specific crime punishable by hudud and be aware of its prohibition by God and still engage in it hence theoretically liable for punishment. Number eight, evidence must not, must not be sought through tajassus, seeking out offenses done in private. And there are many more conditions outside the scope of this session. Professor Jonathan Brown, who is the Chair of Islamic Civilization Studies at Georgetown University and the Editor-in-Chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam and the Law, says, quote, In order to cut off a hand for sarba, a specific kind of theft on something that is hidden, the perpetrator must meet all the following requirements, unquote. Then, he then lists a long list of requirements that must be met and adds, quote, if any one requirement was not met, that established enough ambiguity to make hudud punishment unlawful. And this standard is applied to all hudud punishments, unquote. Then the question becomes, so, what happens to the perpetrator? Is he released because one of the conditions for hudud is not met? The answer is not if there was sufficient evidence against him, in which case he would be punished under different category of law, not by hudud. All the non-hudud offenses are dealt with according to ta'zir. Remember, we mentioned ta'zir, which means the judge sets the punishment according to common practice. This becomes just like in Western courts, where a person might be found guilty under civil law, but not under criminal law, or vice versa. Same thing in Sharia law where a person may be found guilty of violating the rights of humans, but innocent of violating the hudud. I hope that was clear. Again, the critics of Sharia, are they aware of above conditions? You may ask then, why have punishments on the books, like chopping off hands, if they cannot be applied or their requirements for certainty are so hard to meet that it is almost impossible to apply these hudud punishments? Why have these laws in the book? The short answer is deterrence. You see, for a given, often, uh, for, for a given crime, if there is a little chance of being caught, then the punishment should be harsh enough to turn away 
or scare away anyone from ever committing the crime. According to Brown, quote, having laws on the books that are not intended to be applied is normal in all types of laws, unquote. He then lists a couple of examples. Quote, in 1820, there were over 200 crimes punishable by death in Britain's laws, which included crimes like stealing firewood and poaching fish from another fish pond. The colony of Virginia had the death penalty for taking vegetables or fruits from a garden, unquote. And then, of course, we have 20 states in U.S. still have laws against adultery, yet none enforce it. Back to Sharia law. Perhaps another reason the hudud punishment is there to remind people of God's rights in addition to people's rights and the enormity of the sins they usually can get away with or they usually get away with. So, we discuss if it is next to impossible to apply hudud punishment then the criminal is punished by judge's discretion, which can be common punishments like jail sentence, etc. So then the big question, what's the problem? What is the problem? The disenchantment about Sharia tends to stem from either an unclear understanding of what we discussed above, or instances of misuse of justice back home in the Middle East. In the name of Sharia, of course. All the unjust acts, misuse of justice, and Sharia law that they do in, you know, uh, back in Middle East uh, countries. In fact, the establishment and internalization of justice in the supreme purpose of Sharia. I mean, that, that is one of its primary uh, uh, goals that establishing justice, that is the supreme purpose in Sharia. As the Quran says, all you who believe stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even if it is against yourselves or your parents or your kinfolks, and whether it be against rich or poor, for Allah can best protect both, and so on. And it also says, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعْهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْتِ Indeed, we sent our messengers with clear proofs and revealed with them the scripture and the balance, the standard, so that mankind may stand forth in justice, in equity. Chapter 57, verse 25. Today, divine laws are considered by the vast majority to be medieval, barbaric, and primitive. Sharia, likewise, is interactively coupled with merciless executions, chopping off hands, and honor killings. To accept such generalized picture of an intensely complex legal system is not only a disservice to divinely ordained law, but also to one's own sense of integrity and intellect. You know, if we were to compare Sharia with common law, you know, the secular law, Sharia stacks up equally. They both talk about, they say yes to freedom, human rights, justice, equality. With the difference being that Sharia comes from divine source, whereas common law was drafted by human beings. In consultation or participation in the process of decision making, votes, referendum, or what we call shora, 
they both say yes, the common law versus Sharia law. But the difference is certain laws and restrictions are timeless under Sharia. For instance, prohibition of alcohol, whereas laws and amendments can change at will within a common law. Um, in areas like establishment of federal and local governments, religious freedom, right to privacy, abolishment of guilt by association, common defense and, uh, you know, peacemaking, both the common law and Sharia law are the same. They both say yes. However, Sharia encompasses all aspects of life, such as dietary, dress code, finances, and socioeconomic, only on the forbidden. Not on the allowed, on the forbidden. The rest are allowed just like common law, or left to the society to make such laws. On the other hand, common law leaves matters such as, you know, dietary consideration, relationships between consulting, cons, uh, consenting adults, dress code, and economic choices to the preference of individuals. Do these critics, critics and misinformed bother to study and read about details of Sharia along with the conditions for hudud application mentioned above before making such claims? Of course, we, you know, where and which one of the above objectives and conditions conflict is in conflict with modern society and human rights. Of course, we're talking about the laws themselves, not their implementation by today's so-called Islamic courts, which can be debated, as we mentioned, few, uh, you know, aspects of it today. And I'll give a few examples later. Myths about, there are myths about Sharia. Let's dispel some of the prevalent myths and bring clarity to the matters of, matter of Sharia. Like forced marriage, honor killing, and the claim that non-Muslims are not protected under Sharia law. These are all myths and do not exist under Sharia. Forced marriages and honor killings do not exist or are not sanctioned in Islam. Unfortunate deaths caused by misguided emotions must be dealt with by the courts as murders. Rape is a serious offense which is punishable by death. The rapist must be penalized, not the raped woman. In Islam, the raped woman is treated as a victim, not an accomplice. Another myth, Muslim women may seek divorce for grounds such as physical or mental abuse, adultery, abandonment, not meeting marital obligations, etc. With regards to custody of children, Sharia permits parents to decide with whom the children will stay. If they, are, if they are in disagreement, they may allow the courts to decide for them. In principle, however, mothers are preferred as the primary caretakers for young children, and fathers are required to provide for the children's maintenance. Non-Muslims under Sharia are protected so long as they pay the annual tax, called jizya, again, under true Islamic government. This is a nominal amount which does not amount to hardship on the part of the taxed person. Jezia exempts a non-Muslim from military service and, and from paying zakat, payment for the poor, which Muslims must pay a tax considerably more than jizya. In return, the non-Muslims are given protection by the state. Jizya is not a poll tax, and it is not charged to the elderly, poor people, among women and children. Muslims pay zakat to the Islamic government. However, because zakat is considered to be an Islamic act of worship, it is not required for non-Muslims. When it comes to inheritance, 
A woman's share is half of man's because she has no obligation to provide or make any financial contribution to the family and whatever she earns is hers to keep because her husband or father or brother are required to provide for her. There is more of this, this point um, we talked about in a session called marriage and divorce. Another myth, it is often claimed that a woman's testimony is half of that of man's. Therefore, because of being a woman, her intellectual and social uh, value is half of that of the man. Firstly, the vast majority of scholars view the verse of the Quran, uh, chapter 2, verse 282, in the context in which it occurs, testimony regarding financial transactions which was mostly conducted by men and are still the case in, in, in most places. Hence, their familiarity, expertise, and recollections. Of course, today, most transactions are signed by two witnesses in addition to both sides' signature at the time the contract is written. Hence, once recorded in the recorder's office, it becomes official and the, re re the record itself serves as the witness and no further witnesses are required in later time, man or woman. Secondly, studying the verse and the context reveals that the testimony of one woman is, as a witness is sufficient and the second woman is there as a witness, just as a reminder. So the second witness serves as a reminder. In the case, first one forgets. Thirdly, there may be cases in which the opposite is true, where a woman's testimony is required in an issue related strictly to women. Fourthly, the next verse, verse 283, says, if any of you trusts another, let the trusted deliver the trust, which implies if both sides know each other and trust each other under such condition, no need for witnesses, man or woman, and the transaction can occur without them. Hence, it is not about the witness gender inequity or even an absolute ruling of always needing witnesses for any transaction. Rather, using common sense. As we discussed, the recorded transaction deed is sufficient and becomes the official witness in cases where both sides do not know each other and need to retrieve the record later time. In summary, it is not a question of whether Sharia is right or wrong. Rather, right or wrong come from the official or the judge who enforces the Sharia law, or his acumen, his intelligence, and his knowledge of fiqh. The naive and simple-minded deem Sharia to be a mold, a ready-made book, or a computer disk that you insert in a slot and get a decision. They forget that Islamic Sharia contains the very element of its flexibility. Some of its provisions lend themselves to change according to a change in circumstances, while some do not. Unfortunately, the enforcement of Sharia, that is where the right and wrong comes from. The enforcement of Sharia law by the officials in some of the so-called Muslim countries have been misleading misused and hypocritical, and he has given the bad name and reputation to Sharia law. And for that, I give you a few examples, and then you will see the point. Example number one. An opinion was voiced years ago that it is haram, forbidden, for a woman to drive where was this Sharia justification for this opinion? Where was the Sharia justification 
for this opinion. If, if women rode camels and horses and drove carriages back in early days, where did unlawfulness of driving a car originate? In these societies, women driving a car were called prostitutes. Which is more heinous crime? Which is the more uh, heinous crime? Driving a car or accusing chaste women of being prostitutes? Why weren't the slanderers indicted on Sharia grounds? Sharia considers punishment for slanderers and those who defame. Female drivers may be accused of infringing some norms or tradition, but why involve Islam and Sharia law? Example number two. Countries or communities who pretend to be Islamic, hence enforce Sharia law, apply it only at their own convenience. They cheat, they lie, embezzle, bribe, and promote corruption, yet want to apply Sharia law when it is to their advantage. When they target their opponents and their family and send their agents to his home in his absence, then rape his wife or daughter, and when she reports the incident, she's accused of adultery and her case is not even investigated since she cannot bring forth four witnesses as stipulated by Sharia. Really? Is this enforcement of Sharia? No forensic analysis? No corporate DNA matching? Because Sharia does not require them? This is a mockery of Sharia. Any injustice surmised cannot be attributed to Sharia. Example number three. A judge from another so-called Islamic country or Islamic Republic order a man, orders a man's hand be cut off for stealing a sheep to feed his family. Yet the judge himself is a thief and has been embezzling money, taking bribes, stealing people's nest eggs through setting up retirement accounts, then declaring bankruptcy. Who is going to cut off his hands? All the while, in the same so-called Islamic country, the head of the judiciary system or the country's top judge himself who was appointed by the supreme leader, has committed the greatest injustice by torturing political prisoners and killing tens of them through 15-minute trials without defending lawyers and expropriating people's properties. Where is the Islamic court for him? Why is Sharia law not applied to him? Example number four, another case for so-called Islamic country whose first action after coming to power was to close girls' schools and dismiss women from their jobs, forgetting that the quest for knowledge is the duty of every Muslim man and woman alike. Did Sharia prohibit women to receive education? earn a degree, or earn an honest living? The same government lashed men, gave lashes for men who shaved their beard or trimmed their beard. Really? Today, uneducated and intolerant people in various Muslim cultures have taken the law into their hands, acting in manners that contradict the letter and spirit of the Sharia. In conclusion, none of the above description of Sharia presented here conflicts with today's human rights and what is adopted 
in many of the constitutions in free world. In fact, the liberty and justice written in the U.S. Constitution less than 250 years ago was first brought and implemented by Islam 14 centuries ago. It is not the Sharia law in question, rather who is implementing it, and whether they are authorized or legitimate or qualified to do so. Sharia safeguards society through three lines of defense. Conscious, devoutness, and field of competence or education, all required for implementation. That was number one. Number two, removing the cause of crime, which includes economic reform or whatever it takes to remove the cause. Otherwise, it will keep happening, as we see in today's secular societies. Then number three is a penal code. If Sharia is fully enforced, its success is ensured. However, if it is enforced partially or implemented improperly by unqualified, its failure is inevitable. We need to understand Sharia was not made by people, nor was it an accumulation of people's experience. Its guidance ruling and teachings are from Allah. The Almighty, the Creator, the Most Merciful, and the Ultimately Just. One who knows His creation, the one who knows what is beneficial to them and what is harmful. It is comprehensive, encompassing, and complete. It shows its guidance wherever we are, at home, in the mosque, at work, and in the society. It rules our relationship with our Creator, within ourselves, with each other, our families, our communities, and the whole society. It teaches us how to deal with people, and even animals and objects. It appeals to our physical needs as well as our intellect and souls. We have sent down to you the book explaining all things, a guide, a mercy, and glad tiding to those who submit. Chapter 16, verse 89. As for the critics of Sharia, we can quote what psychology says, which is, when we do not have the knowledge about something, we fear it. And, we, and when, when we fear it, we lose our calm and rationale. And when we lose our calm, we hate the person or the thing that caused us to lose our calm or be agitated. Therefore, so long as people do not understand or misunderstand Sharia, they will continue with this hostile attitude. It is the job of us Muslims to educate the masses about the realities of Sharia. Ibn Qayyum said, the Sharia is entirely justice, compassion, wisdom, and prosperity. Therefore, any ruling that replaces justice with injustice, mercy with cruelty, prosperity with harm, and wisdom with nonsense is a ruling that does not belong to Sharia, even if it's claimed to be so according to interpretation. We ask Allah to provide us with the opportunity and help us reach out to those who don't understand or misunderstand. We ask Allah to help in propagating his deen properly. We ask Allah to grant us the wisdom and remove any ignorance so our societies understand his sharia correctly and implement it properly. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asri inna al-insan lafi khusr illa al-ladina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasawu bil-haqqi wa tawasawu bil-sabr. Assalamu alaykum.